Now the floor is open uh, for questions, comments. Uh, please raise your hand. I just want to ask Mr. Panditan. I mean, at the a very early period, I mean, when you start talking I and mean, giving your presentation, presentation, you mentioned that you don't quite remember about your time in the I mean, serving with the military in 2010. But I'm from Council of Newspaper, and I would like to remind you that people who lost their friends and relatives in the violence committed by the military in 2010, don't forget about that. And I think, sir, you owe the public an apology for your role in 2010. And I ask you, would you give apology now I mean, on your behalf? Now, this is not a, for, a forum for, for apologies. I'm sorry. You can ask a question. You can make a long comment. But as Mr. Tin and Aaron has said, that the symbiosis with the military and the monarchy is quite strong. And there are people who worry about what might happen after the king passed away. What would be the role of military in keeping that period, in that chaotic period? I mean, would the military interfere or intervene to establish some kind of a temporary or transitional military governance in order to keep peace? I mean, would you, would you have any comment on that? You is mean that I'm army chief. Uh, Supreme Commander, you have to promote me right now and I can answer that because uh, I think it's difficult to answer that because I'm not representing for the armed forces. It's, uh, it's uh, depend on people who be being a leader. But uh, if you promote me tomorrow, I can answer you. I, I hope that you do not, as you are now doing, uh, trying to twist my words and, and make it out of context. Uh, uh, I hope you don't do that. Uh, you're working for Khaosot, which is respectable. My comments in the, in the beginning is just uh, breaking of the ice. I, I, you know, uh, if Chan Chi Jinan asked me specific questions on those days, uh, I don't remember. I have to look at the note. No one remember uh, specific details. Uh, that's very normal standard uh, uh, reply. And, and it's not specifically about those apologies, killings, uh, the, or loss of lives, those are being handled by the court. And I'm part of that investigation, I'm part of, the, of that solution. I'm giving answers to DSI, you know, I, my cause is in the public. In fact, my, my talk today should be beneficial to Khaosot and your readers uh, in the sense of the progress that we've made, the problems that we face. So children and I, make sure you, you understand that, all right? Uh, I of think course, that, 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 that one point, yeah, uh, 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 and make a record clear that uh, 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 you don't twist that uh, in, into into that, into that. Uh, uh, I hope you don't. My, maybe uh, just I, I didn't make myself clear. So uh, this is clear. That's num num number one. Um, uh, number two, of course. Uh, uh, I think the problem with uh, with uh, Mitri. Uh, uh, it's also related to my point earlier. It's about leadership. Since the king is the uh, uh, official uh, supreme uh, c commander uh, of the military, uh, when you change to the new era, I think there will be readjustment uh, to the new to the new uh, leadership. Uh, this is very common, uh, very very uh, um, very. Uh, Expected uh, in 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 most countries, uh, I think uh, leadership comes and goes, um, and I think the military is is prepared to uh, to do that. In fact, I think uh, the new uh, restructuring uh, that took place uh, in 1990s. Uh, uh, if you look at the different establishment, uh, it is now more diverse. Uh, the, the role of the uh, Supreme Command is getting more prominent. Uh, the appointment of recruitment, the uh, reshuffle is more uh, legalistic. And they tend to rely less and less on personnel from the top. Uh, although problems still uh, with the uh, independence of uh, each armed services, the Army, Navy, Air Force still have uh, independent roles and that give the rise of the and that give the power to the chief individual chiefs but uh, the uh, the tendencies of the military to be more professional uh, is is clear but also slow uh, you need to push you need to push i think chairman made a very good point that the media could help uh, bring the pressure into that to that uh, to that change 
but the, but still, I think my 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 thinking uh, and and I, I end here. I will end here. My thinking is that um, I think the the very uh, important change would come from people like uh, Tiranan or many progressive forces inside the military, General Bun Sang and many other generals who are very progressive, very able to push for the change from within. Uh, we need to we need to do that much more. I'm quite struck from time to time when our friends uh, from democratic countries like United States, Australia, England, and others, uh, they took these military people, uh, educate them, retrain them, you know, and, and make them very progressive, very professional. But when they return, what happened to them? We have many military assistance programs for more than three decades. We have many progressive uh, leaders uh, in the military. What happened to them? Uh, this is the problem that we need to look into it much more, how to promote these officers. Uh, not a token you know, uh, like this, but much more systematic, uh, much, more, much more elaborated. I think one of the problems is a curriculum at the military cadet. I think the uh, Crown Princess uh, Sri Nton has tried to push for major restructuring at the Royal Cadet, uh, uh, but but and they're adopting. I, I'm I'm told that they are now working with West Point and and many other leading uh, military cadets in the world. Uh, I'm not so sure. Maybe you can report more. But I think once we can recreate that within inside the, uh, the the structure of the of the curriculum, the structure of the of, of the. Uh, of the training, uh, not overseas, then you can have a much more able uh, officer that try, that able and ready to push for changes from within. Yeah, yeah. A, a little bit about the curriculum. Right now, uh, they change a lot in the past uh, during uh, Cold War period. I have a five year and everyone graduated uh, study in engineering. But right now, we have a more in social science. We have a lot of uh, history, and uh, we have a uh, more uh, understand uh, the neighbor country. Also, they change a lot uh, right now. Okay, thank you, thank you. This is a very good question. Uh, it's very common. I think it's a big puzzle for us. Uh, Doctor Kwasong is a detached uh, observer and scholar from outside. And perhaps would you have a short reflection on this? The role of the military uh, now and going forward during the transition of the monarchy. Well, the Thailand chapter actually deals with aspects of the relationship between military, politics, and monarchy, so uh, you can read the details in the book. I mean, I'm, I'm from Europe, obviously, because Germany is in Europe, and we had a, a royal succession last week in Belgium. No one was talking about the military in Belgium during that uh, succession. And I think it, it tells us a lot about this, the, the, um, the state of democracy, civil military relations, and the role of uh, the monarchy in this uh, in, in, in politics, uh, that someone in this room asked about the role of the military during a royal succession, uh, which is very, there are only a few countries in the world where you would ask that question. Uh, most probably are on the, are the Gulf monarchies, plus, plus Bhutan. That's basic. That's pretty much it. So there are only ten or twelve countries in the world, or let's say thirteen probably, where you would ask, where you would think that the military is a important factor or actor in a royal succession in the early twenty first century. Uh, and well, we have an extremely interesting debate going on uh, in the in Middle East studies, near and Middle East studies. How come that some monarchies failed in the 1950s and 60s, while others survived until today. Uh, and and uh, one, of the, one of the lessons of this comparative research on monarchies in the Middle East is if a monarchy has to worry about the role of the military during a su succession process, it has to worry about its future. Thailand as a high-risk, coup-prone country. But just to broaden it, are there any other countries in Asia that are high-risk, coup-prone on your list? And can you specifically talk about Myanmar? Because, I mean, Myanmar hasn't had a coup for quite a while, but uh, uh, it certainly it fits your other category of having been controlled by the military without coups for a long time. And so just to follow up, uh, uh, Tiranan, can you just comment on that? Do you think Thailand is a high-risk, coup-prone country? Huh? 
Thank you very much for the question. That gives me the opportunity to announce that my forthcoming article in the Australian Journal of International Studies, which deals with coups in Southeast Asia and coup risk and who are the coup, the, the high risk countries and who are the uh, low risk countries. And how come that, to answer the first part of your question, how come that Myanmar and Thailand, who are both coup prone countries, have a very different record? in terms of coups. The last coup in, in Myanmar took place in 88, 89, which was an intra-military coup. Uh, uh, but uh, both countries are coup-prone countries, but Thailand obviously faces a much higher frequency. Of coup. Coups take more off place in Thailand than in Myanmar. How come? My answer would be what explains the, the relative uh, low number or small number of coups in Myanmar is that the, Myan that the military government in Myanmar found a way to institutionalize credible commitments among military elites. So how to make sure that no one breaks the agreement that is in place. Uh, and they developed coup proving strategies as, as it would be called in the literature. So certain devices, forms of leadership, oversight and, and management which uh, reduce the ability of the military to stage a coup against the military government. So, uh, in, in Thailand, I would argue, uh, but again, this, this is just my, my, my personal view, or as, a, as we explain it in the book, what Thaksin tried to do between 2001 and 2006, parts of it could also be labeled as coup proving. So uh, taking over control over military nominations, making sure that the right guys uh, hang around in the right positions, probably uh, uh, relatives or friends or whatever. Uh, uh, so, but he wasn't very successful with that. Strengthening the police uh, to, build, to counterbalance to some extent uh, the coercive capacity of the military. We talk about that in the book. Uh, in, in Myanmar, they were very successful in developing these kinds of strategies coup proofing search and institutionalized credible commitments. And I have a forthcoming article on, uh, together with one of my students, on so-called political liberalization in Myanmar. And our argument is the whole constitutional process, the whole liberalization process, is basically an attempt to institutionalize credible commitments among competing military elites. Uh, you don't have to agree with that, but that, that would be the answer to your the second part of the question. How do we explain the difference between Myanmar and Thailand? Sorry, just to follow up, you think that Myanmar is not high risk right now of, of a coup, huh? in oh. the current situation? Huh? So, uh, well, I think Myanmar is structurally a high risk country. Structurally. That does not mean that I would say there is an immediate threat of a military coup. Well, I, 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 I'm not a Myanmar expert. I, you, you must be really, really be on the ground and, and closely observing the situation. That's not what I'm saying. Structurally, it's a high-risk country. That's my argument. May I respond to the question? Uh, I, I like to say this. Uh, from 1991 uh, until now, it's the same plan for the cool thing. You, you can do an easy one first, you uh, see the uh, free TV, which is uh, Channel 5, and then you announce that uh, you force the, free, the rest of the free TV to other, uh, uh, you know, relay the signal, and then you deploy the troop around 200 company to the point. Uh, we have the plan for the old time until now, use the same plan. What do you think we, if some people try to do the cool thing in the same plan? It's going to be success? People are gonna, you know, right now they change a lot. Uh, I think a couple of years from uh, maybe uh, 2010 or before that, uh, radio, community radio can deploy the mass of the people around 10,000 in 30 minutes. It's not easy for me. It's, uh, I'm a teacher and I'm also an instructor and, and teaching a lot of class that, you know, uh, students can ask me, hey, doctor, is going to have a uh, cool again? or something like that. I said, no, it's difficult. But during the 2006, I said, before a coup allow uh, one week, I said, oh, no way, impossible, because at 91, 92, have a fax and a mobile phone can deploy the people. But it happened after that 19 uh, September, it happened. You see that, not guarantee, but it's, for me, it's difficult to happen this again, because uh, I think they have uh, a lot of, uh, uh, information to uh, counter the cool thing, which is that uh, civil society have a lot of um, uh, uh, idea how to counter that, but you can't find a public in it.
Yes, this is a good point. The um, cool recipe may no longer be the same. So you cannot roll out tanks from certain army units, cavalry units. For example, the lead unit in, in Bangkok would be the fourth armored cavalry. Uh, it's in some sense, and you know now you have taxi driver who will ram his taxi into a tank, and uh, uh, so I'm not sure if the recipe uh, holds anymore. Uh, Dan Brintan wants to have a, a word. Uh, I'm not going to predict uh, the next coup, Peter. But uh, I, I suggest uh, m maybe the last coup, uh, uh, one month before before the coup took place, Kuntia uh, Turukit uh, reporter came to my office and we had a good discussion. And the next day, one month before the coup, he wrote a headline uh, saying that I predicted the coup will happen within a month. Uh, I suggest you to go back and read that uh, 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 newspaper, and I think uh, uh, you may understand what the uh, composition of factors contributing to the last coup. I think we, we predicted that, and, and, and we were right. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure it could be duplicated. The different uh, situation, different circumstances always produce a different uh, uh, outcome. But the last time we, we, we had interesting uh, prediction, and we were right. So uh, one month. Uh, before the coup, uh, reported uh, on headline by Mr. Pakon Pungnen, Kung Thep Turkip, yeah. Yes, probably from the Nation newspaper. Um, perhaps a question for, particularly for Professor Croson and perhaps to Colonel Tiernan as well. Um, uh, Professor Croson, I, I to, because you have an overview of the military role in Asia, so I was wondering if Thailand is unique in a sense that the mainstream mass media um, often uh, uh, interview the army chief on a very regular basis and on various sort of issues you know politics and not nothing not just things that are particularly related to the military or the army is that a common thing in perhaps in Pakistan you made a comparison to Pakistan and also the sort of uh, perception and I think you were quite right in mentioning the uh, importance of the role of civilians in uh, perhaps perpetuating the uh, acceptance of the extra power of the military in society. Uh, in, in Thailand, um, uh, there's still many people who, who now say, well, they, they would acknowledge at least publicly that um, um, having military coup is not uh, something they would support, but yet uh, there's always this caveat, and they would say, but, uh, you know, given the sort of troubles we are having or facing, there's no other option. Um, uh, what would you uh, tell uh, these people uh, um, uh, if you could, you know, whether the, the, such sort of mentality is really outdated or not, or is it really um, very um, um, logical at all? Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I think it's not only unusual for Asia, but probably on a inter-regional comparison you would find the same. That, that's very unusual, even in Pakistan, because Pakistan, the military is much more cohesive, much more hierarchical than probably the Thai military. It's very unusual that military officers go to the media and, 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 and give interviews for everything and everywhere. In Thailand, I think it's the media who goes to the army chief. <laughs> Probably true, but so let me rephrase it. It would be very unusual that the media in Pakistan goes uh, to interview military officers. Uh, the second, uh, having a coup is, is, is a coup option, I would say. Well, under certain circumstances, I mean, there is a debate about the legitimacy of a coup. Can, can coups be legitimate? Or legitimize that. Yes, from a from a theoretical normative perspective, there are situations. You can imagine situations in which coups might be a legitimate way out of a crisis. Imagine, imagine Third Reich in Germany in thirty eight, thirty nine. Wouldn't a coup have prevented so many deaths and so much uh, 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 a huge catastrophe? Catastrophe in, in 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 Europe and the world, yes. But these are exceptional situations, really exceptional situations. Usually, I would the coup the coup literature shows that coups usually decrease economic growth over a long time, 
and lead to less security in terms of vulnerability for internal armed conflict and external conflict. So measured against output indicators, I would say no. It's the question is, could you briefly discuss the Defense Administration Act and particularly the committee that uh, has a influence over the uh, military appointment list and does that provide a, uh, its effect on civilian military control and does the Prime Minister have veto over decisions in that committee and I guess kind of lastly the current government said that it was going to attempt to change this act but then it it, it suddenly fell off the radar. What does that tell us about Thailand's democratic control over the military? And just a brief observation, I just noticed that there's the audience, I, not, there's some, looks like m not many Thai people here today, and uh, does that tell us anything about the interests of the society about democratic control of the military? So, thank you. Okay, thanks, um, Ian Hollingworth. It was uh, just this question of the coups. We're talking primarily about military coups here, and we've said that they, by and large, have been decreasing in number. This is a question for Professor Crasson. He mentions that um, military and other security forces are more likely to endanger democracy by lessening its quality and depth than by threatening its outright and swift overthrow. So I just wanted to ask him, in his book, does he cover the question of what some people would call soft coups or judicial coups? There are some in Thailand who argue that these coups are, that there is in fact has happened, the coup has happened, but it's not a military coup. I, I think since, since 1997, uh, I, I think the Constitution uh, mandated uh, that our ministries uh, come up with a new uh, structure and the new legislation. Uh, by that time, the Defense uh, Act was dated back since 1960. Since then, 1960. Um, uh, 1960, but they, they amended a few times. Uh, and um, the, uh, the issue is how to increase the civilian control over the uh, ministry uh, and 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 make the appointment more more uh, more um, uh, more transparent, uh, not allowing the military chiefs only to to appoint the the same classmates, uh, and it has been uh, hotly debated and it was delayed. Uh, Thaksin administration came in and appointed uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, at that time, I think uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, uh, Chan Visanu uh, to be the head of the uh, drafting committee, uh, but delayed, but delayed until until uh, the mandate uh, ran out. Uh, the only ministry that failed to to amend its uh, uh, administrative. Uh, law is the defense uh, ministry, and uh, it dragged on until until the coup took place, uh, and and the new defense was adopted. So 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 you have a very long period of uh, struggling how to uh, uh, create a new control, a more balanced control. Uh, two issues at that at that time: one, how to uh, uh, reduce the power of the armed services. Uh, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force chiefs. Second, how to increase the role of the civilian at the Defense Council. Um, uh, and during the coup, you have different push. And in the end, it came out that uh, um, the appointment will be will be adopted uh, at the uh, Defense uh, Council uh, with the top five uh, 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 officers. <coughs> Uh, at the top, the civilian defense minister will share that meeting, uh, and uh, if needed be, they need to vote on on the reshuffle uh, uh, at the top level. Uh, and uh, this is a compromise between uh, reducing the uh, power of the uh, armed services and the increase of the role of the defense uh, council. We would hope that the defense council would comprise these more civilians. It's not the case. It's only. Uh, uh, defense minister, who's of course uh, civilian or not, uh, a deputy uh, only two. We were hoping more, uh, but they opted uh, for less. But they also agree that uh, power will be somewhat reduced from the chief um, uh, to the defense council. Uh, and I think that uh, that's a compromise. 
So now we have that structure. Uh, I think th this administration is looking into maybe changing that, increase the role of the civilian, but uh, I think this plan will be stalled until they amend the constitution. And then, the, uh, and, and not only the, the defense ministry, I think other ministries also maybe are now due to, to amend the new uh, administrative uh, reform uh, issues, uh, reform bills also. Uh, but I would suspect that the defense ministry will be the last again. Uh, uh, they delay tactic, you know, they're struggling within, uh, it's very problematic. Uh, we, we, we need them to at least collapse their le le legal status into one. We, we don't want the each armed services to buy their own weapons. The, the weapon ac accusation uh, should be power, should be moved to the Defense Council. And that is a standing issue that is still very much uh, 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 with the power of the chief. The chief can independently initiate a lot of programs and using the budget. And then that will be the next battleground, you know, for, uh, to, to push them to be more transparent uh, or more, so to say, Professor Fosong said, the more, more democratic, you know, in terms of budget. Yeah. Thank you. We have uh, judicial coups, some people say. Is that a way of uh, intervening without military coup? Could be. Um, military officers can be quite innovative in developing new forms of uh, intervention, for example. in, in uh, So w in, in the book, we briefly talk about the so-called judicial coup. Uh, also, I would say it, it would not qualify as a coup in, according to my understanding, because I understand by coup, a coup as an illegal change of government uh, through the threat or use of force. So probably I would say it's not a coup. But what do you mean type of intervention beyond uh, the threat of uh, the use of force? In Pakistan, the so-called Operation Jackal, what a nice name for it, in, in 98, uh, in 88, the military tried to stage a, a vote of uh, confidence against uh, then Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto. Uh, so the military tried to use parliamentary procedures and its, uh, its own proxy parties in order to uh, topple the government via legal, uh, uh, in, uh, within the legal institutional framework. That's just another way. I'll think about the coup in Turkey in 1997, uh, the so-called soft or postmodern coup. Uh, so yes, they can be very, very creative. Thank you. Uh, before the coup, in 2006, we had problems in Thailand. And since the coup, I think that uh, many will say that we still have many problems in Thailand. So uh, it's not black and white, not that uh, before the coup was all bad or all good, and after the coup was all good or all bad. Uh, this is not to promote the book, but there is something that is very uh, apt uh, to, to convey to you uh, as we close the seminar. It's a chapter on Thailand, and the Jan Thailand has pointed it out to me. It's going to be a very controversial part. Uh, instead of institutionalizing control through democratic procedures, Thaksin increased his personal authority over the military. Attempts to co-opt the armed forces as an instrument of political power only helped to intensify the regime crisis. This, combined with Thaksin's increasingly personalistic and authoritarian government, contributed to the September 2006 coup against him, which was endorsed by the king. And he has a citation from a Chai in 2009. Um, but uh, we are navigating in Thailand between a rock and a hard place. The role of the military in Thai politics will be around for some time. Uh, we don't know who really uh, truly shape outcomes and determine outcomes in Thailand, who really decides in this country, which is uh, the main question that uh, Dr. Kwasong has uh, raised at the outset. Uh, who decides? Who gets to decide? Uh, thank you for coming. We have uh, another seminar, I think, uh, coming on the South China Sea in June, June 20th. But before that, we might have something on, um, on the South or um, or, or Myanmar. Uh, please join me in thanking the speakers, and thank you very much for coming.